we would like to say greetings to all of our Pleasant Green members and listeners. And we are blessed once again to indulge into our Faith Pathway Study Manual for Lesson 5 out of our Unit 1 entitled, David Honors God. And the title for this lesson is, A Greater Plan, A Greater Plan. Our devotional reading is the number of Psalms, 89, verses 19 through 37. Our background scripture is 1 Chronicles, the 17th chapter, verses 16 through 27, as well as our printed passage. Also, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 16 through 27. And our key verse is the 20th verse of chapter 17 of First Chronicles, and it reads, There is no one like you, Lord, and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. Our lessons aims for this, the fifth lesson of our Unit 1 of study, are research the significance of David's prayer in its historical context, aspire to emulate the faithfulness of David as expressed in his prayer, and embrace David's prayer as a model and write a, write a prayer of gratitude and praise to God. Now our lesson has three uh, divisions to it and uh, three sections to it. Uh, the first one is entitled A Humbling Prayer and that will be verses 16 through 19. And our second section is Ver or verses 20 through 23. And then our third section is 24 through 27. And our third section is entitled A Worshiping Prayer. And our second section is entitled An Acknowledging Prayer. So we have three significant sections, a humbling prayer, an acknowledging prayer, and a worshiping prayer. And in our biblical context, uh, it uh, kind of breaks down some uh, references or just uh, some insights into our lesson. Uh, and it highlights that uh, David's prayer includes two parts. Uh, one part is thanksgiving for God's promises, and uh, that will be summarized through verses 16 and 22. And a petition that God confirmed his promise, and that will be verses 23 through 27. And here it mentions that David is not seeking human confirmation. He's seeking God's confirmation. And so uh, he recognizes that God alone is the only one who can sustain his promises. And so uh, as we indulge ourselves into our lesson, uh, we will try and stay focused on uh the motive, uh, the reasoning behind uh, these three different expressions of prayer and the significance thereof. Now, just before we begin uh, to go through the different sections of our lesson, uh, I was reading in the uh, introduction and uh, uh, when we look at our lesson, we will recognize uh, some changes in uh, David's approach uh, 
uh, we'll recognize some changes in uh, David's uh, spirit, uh, his humility. Uh, and we will realize or recognize that these things, uh, uh, they emerged or took place and surfaced uh, because of different experiences that David encountered and the lessons uh, that David learned from those experiences uh, which caused a change of heart and I was looking at the introduction and recognizing uh, something of significance and on the very uh, front page of our lesson at the bottom uh, I highlighted this uh, one, to, uh, one or two sentences and I'd like to share it and it says that too often we fail to realize that the only true change in today's society is the technology. People are still people. Politicians are still politicians and so on and so forth. If we get bogged down in the immediate reactions and irritations, we can easily lose focus and miss out on the greater plan for community revitalization. And I thought that was uh, very significant because <clears throat> we recognize that uh, the only thing that is constant is change. Uh, there is always change. Uh, even God's creation is formulated on change. We go from season to season and uh, we have change in weather, we have change in nature. And um, although it is something that is always reforming itself, that is change, it is the only thing that is constant. It is forever reforming itself, and yet it's not determined. It's not established. And so uh, we would think that something that is constant, that that would mean that it is a determined factor. And yet, it's constantly evolving. Now, let's look at the beginning part of our lesson, the humbling prayer. And here, uh, we find David acknowledging self. It opens by saying, then, and I'm reading from the NIV in verse 16, but it opens by saying, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, Lord? Who am I, Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? Now, David here has realized uh, the different actions that he has participated in, the different things that he has done, his faults, his failures, and he now is overwhelmed by the fact that God has still covenant with him, that God has still fulfilled and revealed to David his promise. And so, after recognizing the shortcomings of David's self, now David realizes just how holy and righteous and merciful God is. And as a result of him reflecting upon himself, now his words, his, his, his motive uh, has changed. He, he now says to the Lord, who am I? Uh, recognizing that I know that God knows who I am. God has sought me out. Uh, uh, God has 
revealed uh, his dissatisfaction with myself and things that I have done that have displeased God and drove a wedge between God and myself. So he he realizes this, but then he says that uh, as it is, as if it was not enough in your sight, my God, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant. You, Lord God, have looked on me as though I was the most exalted of men. Now here he acknowledges that um, I, I know about my uh, weaknesses. Uh, I've, I've kind of reflected upon myself. But, but you have looked at this individual, your servant, you have looked and then responded as though I'm exalted above all men. Um, if anyone that uh, would be close in comparison, uh, it would be the messenger of God to David, Nathan. So he had seen Nathan's character, recognizing that there are men of much more value or much greater virtue and submission unto God. And then he puts himself in that same company and says, you know, you've looked on me as though, you know, I'm ex exalted among all men. And he said, what more can David say to you for honoring your, your servant? For you know your servant. For the sake of your servant and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made known all these great promises. So David is almost in uh, bewilderment. Bewilderment and yet astonished at, and overwhelmed at how gracious God is being to him when he realizes what he has done. And for many of us, if we reflect upon the pitfalls and the mistakes and the uh, acts that uh, we've uh, developed or that we've in, encountered and fall short of the glory of God in different instances, and then realize how God has still looked beyond our faults and saw our needs and recognized that God had a plan for our lives before we were even in the womb of our mothers. But God said, I am going to make the promise, the purpose for which I brought you into the world, I'm going to fulfill that in spite of your pitfalls, in spite of your mistakes, in spite of your knowingly not following my will in your life. And so in our lesson, uh, it, it identifies what David says and it titles it as the loaded question, but it's bathed in humility. David acknowledges his unworthiness before the Lord. And his questions may even appear to be rhetorical, but his questions of who am I and what is my house is posed as David's humble reception of the favor of God and promising to show him despite his misdeeds. God goes ahead and still rewards us, still blesses us, in spite of knowing us. And so uh, <clears throat> when we look at this humbling prayer, it, it's out of humility. Now, uh, we know in some of the other lessons, uh, one that uh, I had to uh, wrestle with uh, entitled Negotiating Obedience because I definitely don't feel that you can negotiate obedience with God, but uh, 
we learn through that lesson that um, David uh, had another approach. Uh, he was trying to perform certain ritualistic practices uh, in, in response uh, to his misdeeds. And so, uh, but what God really looks for is a humble heart, is the humility that we express. Once we recognize that in spite of ourselves, that God is still forgiving, that God doesn't renege or go backwards on what he said because he recognizes that we have been disobedient. And because of that, then God says, well, you know what? I was going to do such and so and so, but now since I've seen your behavior, I'm going to I'm going to go back on what I promised you. No, God's promise is fulfilled. God's promise is God's promise. Uh, first of all, before God even makes the promise, God already knows our weaknesses. God already knows our misdeeds and what we're going to do. But God also knows that just as I know all things, I also know that when it's all said and done, you're going to fulfill my will and my purpose for your life. So now when we look at the second segment of our lesson and acknowledging prayer, now here, <clears throat> sometimes uh, in our own humanness, uh, we find ourselves uh, and, and we will humorously uh, say to one another, man, you are all of that in a bag of chips. I'm telling you, man, you are great. There's, there's, hey, you really know how to handle things. I'm, I'm just, I'm not trying to butter you up and stuff, but you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm like, man, I just want you to know we really appreciate you. I mean, you are awesome. Uh, I don't know how we could do these things without your input. And man, you are the man. You are the man. Uh, but here, it opens up where uh, David says, There is no one like you, Lord. There is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. Now, Sometimes when we acknowledge the awesomeness and the greatness of God, the divinity of God, the whatever other adjective we want to make in association with God and the spirit of God, um, sometimes uh, it's as though, uh, or, or it could be, let me say, it could be perceived as though God needs to hear these things. Those, uh, when people give all of these different accolades and titles and recognition uh, to uh, mankind, to ourselves, uh, some of us get pumped up and, and you know, we, uh, we start feeling more about ourselves than what we should. You know, people calling me this, that, and the other. But, but see, the, uh, the wording, uh, God already knows that there is no other God but God. That God doesn't need to be told that you're the best God, you're the number one God among anything else that we have equated or that we have idolized uh, in addition to you being who you are. Uh, God doesn't need to know that there is none like you, that uh, all these other things we give attention to and find ourselves preoccupied with, they are not, in the end, we find out they are not equal to you. That That is not a surprise to God. Neither is God pumped up and needs to hear this. What God really needs is submission to God's will. What really impresses God is that when we put all of those preoccupations and all of those distractions aside and then live unto God. 
That that lets God know that we've acknowledged him. So the second section says an acknowledging prayer. Well, our submission, our obedience unto God, that's what lets God know that, hey, now they are actually acknowledging me. So the results, uh, the promises of God and, and God saying, I'm going to bless your house and, and, and the seeds of your house are going to be blessed. Uh, yes, of course, God does all of that. But uh, that's not like uh, something that is uh, alerting to God. Uh, once we acknowledge it, there may be a period of rest that God is now saying, finally, they understand. Finally, they received it. Finally, they acknowledged it. They, uh, I don't know what more I needed to do in order to get their attention. But uh, when we look at these things, uh, David is, of course, he, he realizes that God has not just blessed him, but he's blessed the nation. He's blessed the nation of Israel. He's blessed the peopling of Israel. That it's not just his own household or his own lineage, but his entire congregation. Uh, when we look at uh, our place in this day and time uh, and look at our assembly to the Spirit of God, uh, we should be thankful for how God has blessed our congregation our community, our nation, and the world as a whole in the midst, in the midst of political turmoil and unrest, in the midst of the geological system, God's creation undergoing change as well, in the midst of all of this, God is still blessing. And so, um, when we once again look at um, what David is saying uh, in the second segment, the acknowledging prayer, when uh, we read that in our spare time, uh, we should look at the wording, uh, look at what David is actually lifting uh, when he's saying that this is acknowledging God for who God is, uh, how God uh, had taken Israel and performed great and awesome wonders and, and drove other nations out, people who wanted to uh, uh, take Israel over, uh, how God had intervened, and even when they were small in number and outnumbered in many cases, God still allowed them to prevail. And so we uh, need to look also, sometimes we feel as though we're outnumbered and uh, uh, we're small in number. But yet, there is a God that is on our side. Many times we sing, where would I be if it had not been for the Lord on my side? So in our last section, I wanted to read uh, a the background scripture because when we look at the worshiping prayer and here David is acknowledging the promise that God has fulfilled and he's he's like uh, he's in tune not that he could be out of tune but like he's in tuned with what God has said and acknowledged and, and established before him. And so he, he almost starts off with an acclamation here uh, where he's saying, so that it will be established and that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, the Lord Almighty, the God of or God over Israel, is Israel's God, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. Now, we talked about, uh, in the beginning of our lesson, we talked about the uh, greater plan, the greater plan. Uh, 
And I want to read from the 89th number of Psalm. I want to read what uh, the greater plan, I wanted us to have a little insight into the greater plan. Because we said earlier in our lesson that uh, God had already ordained a purpose and a plan for us before we were in our mother's womb. So I wanted to just lift just a few verses out of the 89th number of Psalm. And uh, I'm going to start, uh, I believe I will start at uh, verse 20. Verse 20, and it reads, I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him with my hand, with whom my hand shall be established. Also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. Now, now listen to what, what God is saying. And this uh, 89th number of Psalm is titled the Davidic Covenant. So this is the Davidic agreement that God is proclaiming here to David. And listen to what it says. It says, with my hand, he shall establish it. With my arm, shall I strengthen him. And the enemy shall not outsmart him, not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And he says, I'm going to beat down his foes before him, and I'm going to plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be established. I will also set my hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers, and he shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Now, I want to read further because it talked about this blessing being upon David's house and his lineage and his seed and those to come after David. And it says, I, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, after it's saying, my God, the rock of my salvation, then it says, also, also. I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Now listen to this part here. Because it just talked about that it was going, he was going to bless his seed. He was going to make David, David the highest king on earth. Uh, the rulership, his rulership. Uh, and uh, also the loyalty and the longevity of God's presence in the fulfillment of his promise to David's house. But listen here also, because a lot of times... Uh, we put a lot of focus on uh, God's blessing and uh, what we're going to receive and what we're going to get out of the deal and, uh, and, and deal as the lack of a better word, what we're going to get out of the covenant, the agreement. Uh, the agreement means that there is something that has been said between two parties, two entities, and therefore... Both of them agreed to it. So listen to the other part. A lot of time, as I said, our focus is always on uh, what we're going to receive 
You know, we're on to the receiving end. But listen to the other part of this. In verse 30 of the 89th number of Psalm, it says, If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Now, that part we usually don't like to acknowledge. Uh, that part uh, we usually don't give a lot of credence to. But the reality is, is that uh, we made an agreement. And so when we fall short on our fulfillment of the agreement, there are consequences. We will have to uh, live up to the judgments that we made or the decisions, I should say decisions that we made. God does the judging. But we uh, have to look at that when we decide if we're going to be submis uh, in submission to God's will or if we're going to do our own thing, then we have to live with the consequences of our actions. So, but listen to what he says after he reveals the, uh, the reaction to our disobedience. Then, in verse 33 of the 89th number of Psalm, it says, Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail. Nor after the word that has gone out of my lips, once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Now, I just want to read it again just for our hearing so we can hear what God says even after we have fallen short, even after we have uh, been disobedient, even after we have uh, dissatisfied God's will in our life. He said, nevertheless, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from him nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor after the word that has gone out from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. God is not a man that he should lie. So I wanted us to, as we're looking at these three different uh, sections in our lesson and the last one uh, actually being titled the worshiping prayer or a worshiping prayer uh, when we look at the words that are being spoken in this lesson we should read them over for our hearing so that we can digest what has been said so I hope that something uh, has been shared in our lesson to bring more insight into what Almighty God, the Spirit of God, what God expects from us as individuals and collectively together. And as always, our prayer is, is that those things that God has imparted unto us, that we as listeners will not just be heroes alone, but also doers of the word of God. God bless you and God keep you.